Okay, so can you put up the presentation, please? So I can so I can read it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about the real truth about seed oils, and the reason why I'm doing that is I've been working in the arena of seed oils since 1980 when I got poisoned by pesticides. And I looked very deeply into it because there were so many contradictions in the arena. Like for instance, the biggest one for me was, I read a study that said omega-6 is an essential nutrient that you can't make but have to have in order to live and be healthy. And then the next study I read, it says omega-6 gives you cancer and kills you. And my head, my head just exploded. It's like, okay, you have something that you have to have for health, and then it gives you cancer and kills you. There's got to be something else going on here. And because of that contradiction, it forced me to look deeper. What else is going on? And it turned out that what most of what we blame on seed oils or industrial oils or omega-6s should be blamed on the damage done to these oils by industries processing, and we'll get into the details of that, and by how we use them in food preparation, especially how we damage them when we fry them. And so I realized that I couldn't get healthy on damaged oils. So I decided we should make oils with health in mind and that requires giving them protection because they're very, very sensitive molecules. And so I developed a method for making oils with health in mind where light, oxygen, and heat, the most destructive influences, do not get to the oil. From the time it's in the seed, where nature's packaging protects it quite well, actually, through the pressing, the filtering, the settling, the filling, the bottling, like that's the filling, and until it's in a brown glass bottle, nitrogen flushed with a box around the bottle so no light gets through, in the fridge, in the factory or the store or the home. And so I built this very, has to, you have to build a very tight system. So we built that system and out of that came flaxseed oil. Flaxseed oil is very rich in omega-3, which is the single most widespread essential nutrient deficiency of our time. And, but it's poorly balanced. Omega-3 and 6 need to be balanced. I became omega-6 deficient on flaxseed oil and then developed a blend where omega-3 and 6, both made with health in mind, are properly balanced for the best energy effects of this unbelievably good source of essential fatty acids and energy and all kinds of other hormonal and regulatory functions in the body, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory functions in the body. So anyway, I, I, I've just kind of given you an overview of it. And because there are now a lot of books that are saying don't do oils and don't do seed oils and don't do omega-6s because they haven't done their homework, they have not looked deep enough to understand that what they're blaming on these oils and the omega-6s should be blamed on the damage done by how we treat them. And if we treat them better, if we treat them the way they need to be treated, if we protect them, then they have enormous benefits for the body. But when we damage them, they can do enormous damage to the body. So my slogan is that more health problems come from damaged oils than any other part of nutrition, and more health benefits come from making the oil change that your body needs from the damaged oils to oils made with health in mind. And, uh, and I've been working in the, with oils now for 40 years. I've seen everything. I've heard all the stories. And so hopefully the devil is always in the details. So we're going to look at some of the details. So please uh, take the next. Okay, here we go. So public education. So that's what I've said. And there's every, all the time, there's people writing books about the dangers of seed oils. Right now, it's really hot again. A uh, bunch of people going around. They demonize the omega-6. 
even though omega-6 is an essential nutrient that you can't make but have to have and every cell needs. They demonize omega-6s rather than the damage done to them. They demonize seed oils rather than the damage done to them. They recommend not using industrial oils, which is not a bad idea. They recommend not using omega-6s, which is a bad idea because if you got no omega-6s in your diet, you would eventually die from lack of omega-6s in your body. And then they recommend not using oils at all. And you will usually find that if you don't use any oils, your skin will get dry and your energy levels will go down. And we've, we know this from experience over the years. And like I said, they haven't done their homework. They haven't deep, looked deeply enough into the topic. And they make the assumption that nature's mandate is optimum health. Therefore, you should only eat whole foods. I can argue that uh, concept because I've also tried that out on myself. And I find that if I high grade some of the principles from nature, I actually get better health than if I just eat whole foods. And that's not always true. And, and what I high grade has to be high graded with enormous amount of uh, uh, quality and thoughtfulness put into it, then it works. Accurate, inaccurate books. Yeah, we love freedom of speech. The upside is we get to say what we want. And the downside is we want, we get to say what we want, even if it's not true. And the problem with the free speech, I love free speech, but there has to be accountability and, you know, self accountability at least so that we don't just say oh yeah i know i know when you don't know that you actually go down into the details and dig out the the source of it and in order to do that you have to be in a calm place and not full of beliefs and preconceived ideas and agendas that you want to push so i've been doing this for like i said 40 years and there's so many books, even some of the speakers at this conference, they recommend against using oils. And, uh, you know, I would match them from a health perspective. I am today, I turned 81, I think at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, I turned 81. And uh, uh, pretty much I do, I take oils every day, the, the ones made with health in mind. And uh, I pay attention. I eat mostly plant-based, mostly whole foods, uh, a lot of it raw. Um, and then the other thing that's happening is the research is either misunderstood. Uh, it, it, there's, re there's, there's research now that says that 50% of what is published in the medical journals is actually wrong. And there are lots of reasons why uh, people... Uh, should not make the warranted assumption that everything they read in research study reports is correct. And there's lots of reasons why. Um, the, the, uh, the scientists don't always tell the truth. They are corruptible like everybody else. And you give them this, this, uh, certain kinds of threats or certain kinds of rewards, promise them certain kinds of rewards. There are scientists that will twist their information to prove what the payer wants them to prove and that's a we we know that's true in a lot of industries it's definitely in, true in the oil industry i've been following it for years and uh one of the things is uh, and i'll tell you a story uh, the damage done to oils by industrial processing has never made the mainstream news we got close i was in uh, edmonton alberta and got an interview with uh, CTV, which is the one of the national television networks in Canada. And we had a beautiful interview and I talked about the damage done to oils and, and uh, they loved the interview. They said, we're gonna play it on the news tonight. I had the evening off, so I thought I'd watch myself on television because I usually don't see it. And sometimes you look, see yourself on television, you say, oh, I, I, I squish my nose or I, squint my eyes or you know you can improve your 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 presentation so i thought i'd watch myself i watched the evening news they never played the interview but what they did play was an ad for wesson oils well wesson oils 
happens just to be one of the mainstream oil producers that uh, damaged the oil while they're being produced. And the television station was getting revenue from the ads from that company. So they decided not to play the interview. That's, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's not an unusual situation. Uh, we also, the, um, the conversion studies have been done wrong now for about 20 years. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the people conflate what is food oil foundation and what is oil supplement. The two are completely different. And you cannot take a supplement to fix a damaged food oil foundation. You actually have to fix the foundation. The foundation is, is seeds, nuts, whole foods, and oils derived from them. That's the foundation. When the oils are damaged, then you are, are getting a damaged foundation, and then that will damage your health. And the foundation is about two to four tablespoons for most people, which is one to two ounces, which is 25 to 56 grams, which is between 250 and 500 calories, which is about 12 to 25% of your daily calories. And uh, the ratio between the two is, needs to be uh, paid attention to, because if you get too much of one, it crowds out the other. And if you get too much of the other, it crowds out the one. So we work with the ratio of two to one. That's where we've always in practice seen the best results, although some of the theoreticians disagree with us. And I can't see the rest of my sheet here. Um, supplements is one to two uh, is, uh, yeah, supplements are one to two, one to three grams. And less than 10% of the population takes fish oil supplements. Last I looked, it was 7.8%. Uh, that was a figure from 2015. Next slide, please. So I say the devil is in the details. The devil is always in the details. You can say, a, you can tell a nice story, but when you look at the details, it's kind of like numbers don't lie. You need to look at the numbers. You need to look at the definitions. So that's the homework that a, an author ought to take on by their own self-responsibility before they put out information in public that might end up miseducate them. And so I've already talked about some of this. The imbalance between omega-3 is a problem. Uh, we have doubled our omega-6 intake in the past 100 years, and our omega-3s are down to one-sixth of levels of 100 years ago. So the ratio between them, the balance between them is way off. That's a problem. Lack of other essential nutrients is a huge issue because essential fatty acids don't work in the body in isolation. And we'll get into a list of all of those, those things that affect how they work, how they're converted into other molecules, and, and what happens uh, when we don't get those essential nutrients that they re require. They need to know that in most of the mainstream oils, there are pesticides in the oils because they come from pesticide sprayed seeds. And one of the reasons why they heat oils to frying temperatures in a process called deodorization or distillation, which means boiling the oil, which is the frying temperature, which you're boiling oil in the frying pan when you fry them, it's called film, wiped film evaporation. And the reason they do that is they can remove half of the pesticides. And I found that out from a chemist from the, the American Oil Chemist Society. And I called him and asked him why they damaged the oils. I will get into the damage uh, in a minute. And he said, well, one of the reasons we deodorize the oil at frying temperature is because we can get rid of 50% of the pesticide. Well, I had been poisoned by pesticides, so I was not impressed. And in my head, I'm saying, oh, my God, the other 50% of the pesticides stay in the oil. And so I asked him, 
well, why don't you begin with organically grown seeds? Then you don't have a pesticide po problem to, to bother with. And there was a silence at the other the end of the phone, long silence. And then when he got back, he was really angry. He said, I don't know what your problem is. The oil is only 90 per is only 1% damaged. It's 99% good. And if you got 99% on an exam, you'd be damn happy, wouldn't you? So now I'm back and off and say, well, maybe 1% is not em enough. That's when I started doing the math. And uh, I, I ended up disagreeing with him because he didn't do the math. And he thought, oh, yeah, 1% damage. When you find out how many molecules that is, it'll blow your mind. Uh, is, is not a problem. It is a problem. And the toxins that are created by these damaged molecules, or that are these damaged molecules, there's at more than 10 different kinds of damage that are done. Only two of them are ever measured, so you don't even know they're in there. Nobody talks about it. And, um, and, then, and then that damage is done by chemicals, by light, which produces free radicals, that do chain reactions, 30,000 on average before it settles down. So you get a lot of damage from light. Oxygen, which makes oils rancid and makes them smell and taste bad. And heat, which in the, in the, in the presence of oxygen and light doubles, quadru or quadru up, uh, doubles, triples, or quadruples the rate of reaction of light and oxygen. And in the absence of light and oxygen, after about 300 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 degrees Celsius, begins to twist molecules into trans fatty acids. And then that, that twisting goes up exponentially with increase in temperature. Uh, those damaged molecules never existed in nature. Life therefore never had to make a way to neutralize or break them down. And they, so they tend to uh, pile up in the body the bad body is quite slow in, in uh, getting rid of them. You just through skin uh, shedding and through the lining of your digestive tract shedding, pretty slow. You, although you can sweat some of these oil-soluble nutrients out as well, and we'll get to that as well. And then you ask yourself, how many damaged molecules are in one tablespoon of an oil? Because they told, they, they, the research said a half to 1% of the oil molecules are damaged by the processing. This is before you put it in the frying pan. So I said, okay, well, how many damaged molecules am I going to find in one tablespoon of an oil that is 1% damaged? And when I do live talks, I ask people to give me numbers, guess, because they don't know. Nobody's told them. They don't know unless they heard my story. So they guess. And they always guess at least a billion times too low how many damaged molecules are in that tablespoon of 1% damaged oil. The actual number is 60 quintillion damaged molecules. 60 quintillion, you don't even know what kind of a number that is. Six followed by 19 zeros. It is more than a million damaged molecules for every one of your body's 60 trillion cells. And what kind of damage? Well, you could break the molecules, fragmented molecules, or the double bonds could shift to another place and it changes the properties. Or you could get the twisted trans fatty acids, or you get cyclized molecules, which can be very toxic. Or you can cross link fatty acids within triglycerides or between triglycerides, and then your body can't break those down. Or you can dimerize them, which is put two fatty acids together or trimerizing, put three together or polymerize them where you put a whole bunch of them together and you get like a glue and your body can't break those down. The only two we measure of those 10 is oxidized, so peroxide value, anisidine value and malonaldehyde and trans fatty acids. And if, we're, if they have less than 1% in each category, that, that's considered safe. But and then if you have less than half a percent trans fatty acids, you can put on the label zero trans fatty acids. But if you have a half a percent of trans fatty acids in a tablespoon, you will get about 500,000 molecules of trans fatty acids for every one of your body's 60 trillion cells. That's not negligible, 
negligible and that will have effects. So to call that zero trans fatty acids is actually misrepresentation that hurts the users, that hurts the patients. And then two to four tablespoons is the normal average amount of oil that people take. Uh, we, we recommend a tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight per day, always mixed in food, and the intake spread out over the course of the day. That would be for most people, two to four tablespoons. Oils made with health in mind, properly balanced omega-3 and 6 out of glass bottles and put in the food after it comes off the heat, never, 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 ever used for fry. Okay, so damage by uh, toxic oils produced by light oxygen heat. You're going to hear that uh, quite a few times because that's the big issue for oils, light oxygen and heat. And, uh, and then frying, we'll talk about that more. Next slide. So the total damage, if, I, if we add it up, we put the oils, the industry puts oils in plastic bottles. While oil sh swells plastics and plastic leaches into oil faster than it leaches into water. That plastic oil ends up in your body. That's not good. And we're hearing more and more about the damage that does in the body. Pesticides, we already talked about that. Then light damage, photon damage, free radical damage through the clear plastic because the, the 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 oils are not protected from light then you have the the five to one percent damaged molecules then you take two to four tablespoons so now you got you have to multiply that so say let's say multiply it by three then oxidation from open bottles because they're pretty sensitive so we keep them in the fridge and we keep them closed but once you open it, air gets in, so you, you get gradual deterioration. So we tell people, use up the oil bottle within eight weeks. Uh, this is not oil that lasts forever. Oils are sensitive nutrients. They're like, they're like perishable goods. And then when you burn foods, you burn the oils. You, you, you burn the foods in oils. And frying, you have to multiply the number of damaged molecules in that oil by at least another three to six times because you simultaneously damage the oil with light oxygen and heat in the frying pan. And then every day you have that, and then you multiply it by the number of days that you eat such oils. And let's say if it's 30 years, you would have to multiply that number by 10,000 because that's the number of days in 30 years. And you can do the math on that yourself. And then the damage, you know, misrepresented study results. Yeah, they lie to you. Op often the abstracts are written by somebody. They hire somebody to write the abstract. And sometimes they do that for accountability reasons. Because then they can say, oh, well, I, oh, well, I, oh, if there's a mistake, oh, if something's wrong, oh, well, blame the guy, person who we hired to write the abstract. And then that, that protects their reputation unfairly. And sometimes the abstract, when I read them, you read the abstract, most people just read abstracts. If you read the entire article, you find out that the abstract says something completely different than what the study shows. So th then there's cheating in study design. And that's to get specific outcomes. And uh, we've seen quite a bit of that in the past few years. Um, sometimes it's honest error because somebody didn't think it through or somebody didn't have the, the foundational knowledge they needed to do it right. Sometimes they make wrong assumptions. Sometimes it's based on biased beliefs. Uh, sometimes it's based on hidden agenda. The hidden agendas uh, come from paradigms, you know, how scientists think they put pressure on themselves to toe the, the line. You've, we've seen that a lot in, in the past few years. Uh, they ignore the context, but then they pick a con they, they ignored uh, reporting on the context, but they pick a context that will give them the results that they're looking for. So if you want to prove that the body can't convert omega-3 and omega-6, well, you just pick a context in which that would be true. 
by not getting enough of the minerals and the vitamins you need by having too many saturated fats and sugar and starch uh, and other fats and omega-6s. So you can literally uh, design the study in a, into a context that will give you any result you want. Yes, the body can convert. No, the body can't convert. You just set it up in a way that will show you that. We know science well enough to be able to do that. And then sometimes they're deliberately misleading. And that comes from sometimes peer pressure, sometimes institutional pressure, and sometimes from politics, and sometimes from the people that the researchers get grants from. Because if you get a grant from damaged oil industry, you don't really want to talk about damaged oils because then you won't get grants. So there's lots of, and then when research becomes unreliable, then you have to be depend more on personal experience and personal observation, but you can only do accurate personal observation when you're in a calm, neutral, still thought uncluttered state of being with no agenda other than to find out what is true. And that takes some personal development that is also not a requirement in our professional, uh, in our professional institutions. And so, um, yeah, and then the last issue is that you, if you're, a, if you're a doctor or you're an educator and you're de dealing with patients, you have to be able tr to trust that the manufacturer is doing what they're saying what they're doing, is maintaining the standards and processes they say they've set, and don't change their mind or cut corners for better profit or whatever, or because the company got sold. So there's, there's a trust factor there that also makes it difficult. And as a result, many health promoters recommend foods only and no oils at all. Understandable why, but that may not be the best advice for patients. And I have 40 years of experience saying, yeah, I think that may not be the best advice for patients. Um, I know, I'm not sure that I'm gonna convince any of the, those people, but I'm, I'm at least gonna give it a shot. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna talk about essential nutrients because that's the foundation of everything we do. And essential, the, the definition of essential was developed by researchers based on animal and human studies and eventually on intravenous nutrition because you could control the, the intake of nutrients most effectively that way. And, uh, and they call it nutrient essential by a very specific definition. Uh, but in the marketplace, people will call things essential that are not essential by this definition, because if they say it's essential, then people will say, well, if it's essential, I better buy it. So they lie in the marketplace about what essential means. For instance, uh, fish oil, EPA and DHA are always called, are often called essential nutrients. They are not essential nutrients. Uh, and uh, here, here's the definition. First thing is a nutrient is essential if you must have it to live and be healthy. You cannot make it in your own body from anything else. And you must therefore bring it in from outside. And that would be as food or as supplement. That's the first part. The second part is if you don't get enough of any essential nutrient, your health will deteriorate. Your symptoms will get worse with time. And if you don't get enough long enough, you die. These are the essential building blocks for body construction and repair and maintenance. Life has to have those in order to build a body. Uh, if in the third definition, this is the good news, if you return enough of the inadequately supplied nutrient, essential nutrient, to the diet before you die, then all the problems that come from not getting enough are reversed. And that's because life knows how to make a body that functions optimally if you take responsibility at your mouth 
for optimizing the intake of all of the essential nutrients that life requires to make a body that works. And that definition fits 42 nutrients, 18 minerals, 13 vitamins, nine essential amino acids from proteins, two essential fatty acids from oils. And by the way, those two are the most chemically sensitive high energy molecules of any of our essential nutrients. And how about this? Zero from carbohydrates. There are no essential carbohydrates, which makes carbohydrates the least important food because there's nothing in carbohydrates that you cannot get elsewhere. And then of course, carbs like white sugar and white starch and potatoes and grains and products made with them. The carbs are mainly fuel and carbohydrate fuel can lead to blood sugar swings, insulin swings, mood swings, uh, cravings and carb addiction. Of course, there are also carbs that are fiber and those are good food for, my, for the microbiome and they're also helpful in gut function. But the energy carbs are the least important food, even though we put them on the bottom of the food pyramid in 1977, when the, the, uh, the, uh, this, the, the, what was it called? The, the something on nutrition and health was published. And then they got put on the bottom of the food pyramid. And that's, we should, we should eat the most greens should have been put on the bottom of the food pyramid. The oils got put on top to, for the thing to eat least, those should have been on the second level along with proteins. And carbs should have been, you know, never eat more carbs than you burn, because if you don't burn the carbs you eat, you will wear them because you force your body to turn them into fat if you don't burn the carbs you eat. And most of the overweight, even though people are arguing it, in 20 years from that food pyramid, where carbs became the main food, fool, a uh, food, sorry, uh, overweight in United States went from 25 to 60 percent of the population, and nobody said anything. Anyway, so uh, omega six and omega three, linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid are essential by the researcher's definition. And once again, EPA and DHA are not essential fatty acids, but essential fatty acid derivatives that the body can make when, if, they, if enough ALA in the right amount and ratio with omega-6 is provided for the body. More physical health problems come from damaged essential fatty acids than any other part of nutrition and more health benefits come from essential fatty acids undamaged in the right ratio than any other part of nutrition. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now we're talking about essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6. We've already talked about them. They're the most essential of all essential nutrients damaged by light oxygen heat, here we go again, but more slowly also by water and minerals, creating free radical chain reactions, rancidity and twisted molecules. Of all of our nutrients, they need the most care and they get the least. There's nothing else in our food supply that we dump into a frying pan and wait and watch it turn into smoke. And you know that if you turn food into smoke, you've changed the molecules because that ain't food anymore. And smoke is, is toxic and carcinogenic. And actually, uh, cooks who spend eight hours a day in front of, of a frying pan, because everything these days is, is cooked in the frying pan, have four times more lung cancer than normal people who only spend a couple of hours in front of the fly, frying pan at home. Four times more lung cancer from breathing in the fumes of the oils that they're turning into smoke and then inhaling. Um, Okay, damage during processing and then during food preparation. Uh, and, and then oils that are not made with health in mind also contain pesticides and plastics that drift in from the containers. Alpha linolenic acid is five times more sensitive to damage than omega-6 
linoleic acid. And both omega-3 oh, omega and omega-6 essential fatty acids are converted by the same enzymes, which are called desaturases and elongases, to several derivatives. Der derivatives. And here's an interesting thing that people should question. Since the same enzymes are used to convert both omega-3 and omega-6 into EFA derivatives, the question is, why is there no problem with omega-6 conversion? But why is there a problem with omega-3 conversion, supposedly? And the answer is, we get plenty of omega-6 to start with to do the conversion. And 99% of the population gets too little omega-3 to start with. So the issue of conversion is not a genetic problem. The issue of conversion is a problem of not getting enough starting material to get, allow the body to do optimum conversion. Now, what people say is, no, 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 your body can't convert omega-3s and therefore you should take fish oil. It is a, that is a marketing hype and is not true. And then some of the omega-6 and omega-3 uh, derivatives are also converted in the body into uh, three series of what's called eicosanoids that have a wide range of hormone-like regulatory functions within every cell in the body. Omega-3s uh, derivatives are also converted into very powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory molecules. And in fact, omega-3 is the only molecule among the essential nutrients that can serve both as high energy fuel, and about 80% of what you get is burned for energy, and 20% is converted into other molecules that have regulatory hormone-like functions and do spark control as antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. Let me just say that in a different way. You know, the high energy fuel, you know, you want to build a fire in your body. That's your vitality. That's your energy. That's your juice. And omega-3s uh, do that. They, they are more high energy than any other molecule. They're most chem more chemically active. So they get you that high energy. Our athletes got 40 to 60% increase in stamina within a month of starting on the blend that we use that is richer in omega-3 than omega-6. So huge energy increase. But when you, and that's the fire, the fire of life. But the, the stronger the fire is, the more sparks it throws. And the sparks are free radicals that do damage to tissues where they land. Unless you have spark control in the fireplace, it's your screen. But in your body, the spark control is provided by anti-inflammatory and antioxidant molecules. And we'll talk about them a little more. Next slide, please. Okay, so the properties, mostly omega-3. So ve vegetarians on low-fat diets often get dry skin and low energy levels. And both are improved by getting enough of the right kind of oil. How do I know that? I went to the International Vegetarian convention, not a conference, a convention in Las Vegas. I think it was in 1996, somewhere around there, 1996, 1997, maybe even 1995. And when I got up on stage uh, to give my talk on fats, I, I asked them, how many of you are on a low fat diet? And this was in like, yeah, oh, everybody was on low fat diets. Everybody thought, and most vegetarians thought you should be on a low fat diet. And, and the low-fat craze, you know, out of that food pyramid, they were into carbs, but limit the oils. How many of you are low-fat diet? All the hands went up. Everybody's on a low-fat diet. And the second question, I said, how many of you have dry skin? And all the same health hands went up. And I said, here's the mistake. There's a lot to be said for plant-based nutrition. But the mistake that you're making is you're not getting enough oil and one of the ways we measure optimum intake of oil is by how your skin feels. If your skin is dry, that shows up more in winter than in summer because you burn more oil for heat. And it shows up in deserts more than in humid places. But even in humid places, people get dry skin. So dry skin 
is our measure of optimum intake. Your skin should be soft, smooth, and velvety. And if your skin is, and, and the reason why that's a good measure is because oil, uh, uh, um, the inner organs get priority on the oils you eat because they're required for heart function and liver function and kidney function and all your inner organs, your lung function, your brain function. They're super important on the inner organs. And skin gets them last and loses them first. So skin is a good way to measure optimum intake. The first thing that'll happen is not that your heart dries out, but that your skin dries out. You can live with dry skin. So this is nature's priority for your benefit. Uh, so, and the, and the truth is, the research shows there are five times more, oh yeah, so omega-3 alpha linolenic acid. They're five times more sensitive to damage by light oxygen and heat than omega-6. I know I've already said that. 99% of the population does not get enough for optimum health, says the research. Every cell needs them. And increasing omega-3, this is a summary of the research, increasing omega-3 improves virtually every major degenerative condition of our time as long as they are not damaged and are free of toxins. Uh, and, and what that means is anything that improves when you increase omega-3s was the result of omega-3 deficiency because omega-3s can only fix what lack of omega-3 causes. They will not fix magnesium deficiency. They will not fix vitamin C deficiency. They will not fix uh, zinc deficiency but they will fix everything. They will reverse everything that comes from not getting enough of the essential nutrient. And in this case, we're talking omega-3. Now, omega-3 and 6 ratio is important. And we found the best ratio in practice, twice as much omega-3 as omega-6. You wanna have enough omega-6 not to become omega-6 deficient, because that can happen. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and you want to high grade the omega-3s because they're the most often too low essential nutrient of our time. Omega-3, I already told you, is the only fuel molecule that gets you both the fire, the energy, and provides the free radical neutralization, spark control. It is the best fuel. When we did, we measured athletes uh, in their sport, when they did their sport to exhaustion, Within 30 days of beginning to use the blended seed oil that is made with health in mind with the two to one ratio at a tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight, weight for day, per day, within 30 days, their endurance, their performance to exhaustion went up by 40 to 60%. Now we thought the athletes were gonna tell the world and make us famous. <laughs> But they didn't because when, a, when athletes, because it's so competitive, when athletes get, a, get an advantage, they keep it to themselves. So we never got them to tell the world. So we're still, we're still uh, batting away. And the, the athletes we worked with, cyclists, runners, bodybuilders, weightlifters, strong men, strong women, martial artists, one boxer, football players, hockey players, marathoners, martial artists, and um, uh, ultra marathoners. So we worked with quite a few different, uh, both strength and endurance sports. They built muscle faster. They had less inflammation. They recovered and healed faster from injury and surgery. With mothers, consistently, their pregnancies are less eventful. And there's research that shows that women are depleted of omega-3 during pregnancy. And they get two to 15 times more than men, depression, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, colon inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. They've, the research has shown that each child depletes the mother further of omega-3s. And that's because they're required for brain development. And if the mother doesn't have enough omega-3s in her diet, nature will take it from her brain because the child is the future mums the past and if necessary nature will sacrifice the past for the future each child gets 
Each child depletes the mother further. Each child gets less than the previous child. And it's also been shown that intelligence decreases with birth order. Now, there are other factors involved, so it's not 100%. But if you measure IQ of large numbers of people, oldest has the highest, next has a little lower, next a little lower, lowest has the least. And that's because of depletion of essential fat by, by the mother because she's not getting enough in her diet. With the people who use the oil, the kids are born more alert. I have a whole bunch of, uh, they call them Udo babies, uh, people who, whose uh, children whose mothers took Udo's oil during pregnancy. And they, they're born more alert. They take more interest in their surroundings. Uh, that's considered a sign of intelligence before intelligence tests can be administered. And I, we call them Udo baby. And I always like to say, yes, uh, I was not in the bedroom, but I was in the kitchen. Brain function increases. Uh, this research shows that they can increase IQ by up to three to nine points. Uh, that you have more energy, but you're calmer. That you retain brain function as you age. That they keep vision strong. Uh, they're also important in sperm formation. Uh, I don't know why that's in the brain function because, well, we, okay, I won't go there. And you better able to focus and you often have more uh, mental stamina as well. And you become better at problem solving. And I've experienced that myself. I literally one day in my 50s, I, I had to do a, uh, I had a deadline and I worked all day, all through the night, all the next day until the evening. And I couldn't do that in my 30s. I was literally able to stay concentrated for like all day, all night, all the next day. So we're talking about probably 36, 40 hours. And I was tired at the end of it, but I couldn't even do that when I was 30. Weight management. Omega-3s turn on the fat-burning genes in the body, and they turn off the fat production gene. When you take carbohydrates, they do the opposite, but they also interfere with omega-3s doing that. So we say to people, when you increase your intake of good oils rich in omega-3s, lower your carbohydrate intake at the same time. We call that a fuel switch instead of a fuel addition because you you'll see if you take if you give them the oil and they continue eating the same amount of carbs they might actually put on a little weight because if you're taking carbs carbs have to be burned first because if you got too many carbs you get high blood sugar that's toxic then that's all driven into the cells then you then you put on weight then you get low blood sugar that's toxic because you might die then you cr get cravings and you overeat and you get into the carb addiction cycle. Best way to turn off that cycle, lower your carb intake, get your energy from essential fatty acids. They give you stable, long-term, consistent energy. And by the way, your body can store one pound of carbohydrates as fuel, and it can store 300 pounds of fat as fuel. So you tell me, in nature, which one is the preferred fuel? You can run 12,000 miles on 300 pounds of fat in your body. And on that one pound of carbs, you can do about 20 miles and then you hit the wall because you run out of carbs. And because you had the carbs and you carb load it, because people used to do that, then you run out of carbs, but your fat burning isn't turned on and that takes time. And then you drag yourself the last six miles to the finish line of your 26 mile um, marathon so don't do that we told people carb deplete run the, your race on oil not everybody followed us but the people who followed said that is that was amazing i never hit the wall and when i finished the, the marathon i felt like i had the energy to do another one they didn't do another one but they felt like the large the longest distance run in 24 hours in uh united states was set by somebody using the oil that we're talking about. And he ran 152 miles, which is about six marathons. It was either 152 or 156 miles in 24 hours. 
Okay, hormones. They omega threes make hormones work more effectively at the cell receptor level. They make the cell membranes more fluid, so things move around and molecules meet more uh, uh, more effectively, and so the reactions that they're supposed to do happen more effectively. They also uh, maintain normal hormone function for longer as people get older. And that's because they make the hormones work more effectively at the cell receptor level. So you need less hormones to get normal function. As people age, their hormone uh, production goes down. And so this is a, a very important thing to know. Uh, okay, I can't see the rest of my slide here. Oh, that's it. Okay, next slide, please. Cell membrane, they, they make the cell membrane more flexible and fluid. I already said that. And then cholesterol and saturated fat stiffen the membrane. So they slow down reactions in the membranes. Joints, our athletes, especially the, the ones that, uh, that uh, lift huge weights, less pain and injury of their knees, because it, that's where the joint injury is really common because you just have to torque it. And you can wreck it when you, especially when you have like 300 or 500 pounds on top of them. And uh, they had more flexibility and mobility. Scare, skin, hair, hair, nail, I've talked about skin, uh, but hair and nails grow about 25% faster and you get less cracking of your nails, less split end in your hair. You can detox using oil. You wanna bring in a good oil, take more good oil and sweat and then oil soluble toxin will leave your body and you can measure them in the oil part of your sweat. That was done for Vietnam veterans poisoned by Agent Orange and they monitored its, its decrease in the body and they measured its presence in the oil part of their sweat. You can also do oil enemas that can be helpful because it cleans out the lymphatic uh, crypts on the inside of the anus through which oil soluble toxins that the lymphatic system picks up from the extremities of the body, body are enabled to leave the body with the stool. They lower most of the cardiovascular risk factors and that includes blood pressure, high triglycerides, sticky platelets, uh, high cholesterol, especially LDL, C-reactive protein and atherosclerosis, which is inflammatory. They lower insulin resistance they make you more insulin sensitive. So they, they take you a, away from diabetes. And in animals, including dogs, cats, horses, birds, we work with tigers and uh, zebras and all kinds of different wild animals, as well as pocket pets. Uh, they have more energy. They have better skin and hair and hair coat and nails and feathers, less stiffness. They perform better if they're performance animals, they recover quicker and heal quicker from injury and surgery. And older energies have more energy. We had a Sheltie who was like 18 years old. He went from just like standing around to jumping in the back of a pickup after we started giving him the omega-3s that were missing from his diet. Because omega-3s at that time were not even listed as essential nutrients for dogs or cats. They were for, uh, for horses, but not for dogs and cats. And then omega-3 increases thermogenesis. So if you need to lose weight, they increase metabolic rate, they increase oxygen metabolism, and they increase heat. And it's one of the reasons why they keep you warm in winter. And if you take too much omega-3 in summer, you might actually sweat a little more than if you take a little less. I take two to three tablespoons in summer and four in winter. That's, that's, uh, that's the difference in terms of what I need to burn for warmth, for energy. And then conversion takes place in our cells. And I have a note on flaxseed oil, which was the first oil I developed in 1986. Uh, very high in omega-3. That's why we developed it, because omega-3s are so low in, in almost everybody. The ratio is four times more omega-3 than omega-6. Not a good balance. Too high in omega-3. The only oil commonly available that can make you omega-6 deficient. And I know that because I tried it. What happens if I use flaxseed as my only source of oil? Within a couple of months, I ended up with dry eyes, skipping heartbeats. 
arthritis-like pain in finger joints and thin papery skin. Classic omega-6 deficiency symptoms. Fixed it by eating sunflower seeds, which have no omega-6s, but quite a bit of omega-3. And it was one of the reasons why we went from flax oil to a blend where the omega-3 and 6 are better balanced. Uh, Omega-3 derivatives, already you can do it in the body if you get enough starting material. That's the biggest issue. But you can also get it from fish, from krill, and from algae. Most of those, most of the algae and fish oils are highly processed, and that's a problem because fish oils are 25 times more sensitive to damage or five times more sensitive to damage than alpha linolenic acid. So lots of damage done to that. Conversion to EPA, 5 to 10% in men and women both. 5 to 10% conversion to DHA in women. That's important for them, and it's estrogen-based because they need DHA to to make the brain of the child. And it's lower in men because men never get pregnant. Uh, But there are a lot of different studies that come up with a lot of different numbers and you then have to ask why so many different numbers and we'll get to that in a second brain turnover is very small two to four 2.4 to 3.8 milligrams per day so even uh, one gram you'd need less than a quarter less than half a percent conversion to get all the all the dha you need in your brain so a very small amount of conversion goes a long way. And the, and the rate of conversion is affected by a whole bunch of factors. And here are the factors. Most important, not enough starting material, not enough ALA. 99% of the population has that problem. Widespread lack of vitamins and minerals required for the conversion. Vitamin C, 41% of the population gets less than 60 milligrams. The optimum is probably 500 milligrams. B3, a third of the population doesn't get enough. B6, 80%, not enough. Vitamin D, somewhere between 68 and 82%. Mineral zinc, 50 to 60% of the population doesn't get enough zinc. And 80% of the population doesn't get enough, enough magnesium. And all of them are required in the conversion of ALA to EPA, DPA, and DHA. All of them. So that's a big deal. Then there's widespread excess of sugar, starch, saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, trans fats, including CLA, which is 70% trans fats, and too much omega-6. Those all interfere with conversion. I'm getting somebody talking over me here. I don't know where that's coming from. In a unique gene. Thank you. Uh, Okay, and I'm not done yet. Um, And then um, lack of probiotics, because probiotics probiotics seem to help in conversion. Damaged omega-3 molecules will interfere. Toxic and unnatural molecules uh, will slow it down. And drugs like glucocorticoids will slow it down. Maybe other drugs too. I'm getting that. that, uh, For a subtype uh, of ependymoma. Somebody's talking over me again, and please change the slide. The cancer chemotherapy treatment that we're testing in this clinical trial. Can you turn off the override here? Thank you. Many conditions, overweight, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, seems to be a correlation with poor conversion. Women convert more, uh, better than men. I've already said that. Uh, Animal-based foods, which have some of the convertents, slow down conversion. Stress and adrenaline, slow it down. Turmeric improves conversion, so lack of turmeric slows it down. That's that's a silly, actually. Alcohol, smoking, uh, cholesterol, hypertension, uh, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, high blood fats, cancer-causing viruses and radiation can slow down conversion protein deficiency, total fasting, and there is some evidence that age may slow it down. But honestly, I turned 81 this year. I'm not slowing down, and I'm making sure that I'm not taking any convertence because I'm out to prove that if you optimize your intake, 
of alpha linolenic acid, you don't need converted fish oils or algae oils or, uh, or krill oil. The rate of conversion con increases due to nutritional factors and fundamentally better nutrition by optimizing essential nutrients, less toxins, fewer drugs, normalizing weight, having a high omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, foods with phytosterols and phytoestrogens in them, those are obviously, ob obviously whole foods, insulin, protein, fat-free diet, so you don't get the interfering fats, although omega-3s are fats too, and partial calorie restriction. And then under the same conditions, omega-3 is converted four times faster than omega-6. Plant-based people convert twice as effectively. The body will conserve DHA, so it lasts twice as long if necessary, if uh, supply is low. And then EPA is converted into eicosanoids, series three. They're hormone-like molecules that regulate moment-to-moment -moment activities in all our cells. And then uh, EPA, DPA, and DHA are converted into uh, uh, molecules that these are antioxidant, anti-inflammatory molecules that are called resolvents because they resolve inflammation, protectants because they protect against inflammation, and mericins, which do the same thing in the immune system. They're also converted into endocannabinoids, feel-good hormones. This is DHA. Uh, and, and it's one of the reasons why omega-3s elevate mood and lift depression, according to research. Okay, and then I already said this. It's the only molecule that is both high energy and protection from free radical damage. Um, and conversion, again, conversion is mainly a problem because of not enough ALA in the diet. Okay, next, uh, I don't know if I'm at the end of the page here. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now omega-6, also required by every cell. Linoleic acid, necessary for cell membrane function, necessary for brain function, nervous system, necessary for healthy skin along with omega-3, used for anti-inflammatory functions in the body, but also used for inflammatory functions in the body that are important in healing. So when people say don't use omega-6s because they cause inflammation, no, no, no. Inflammation is important in healing function. You need that. And they, are, they also reduce risk of cardiovascular disease. But <clears throat> um, they're present, they're widely present in most oils, omega-3s, you know, you find them in flax and you find them in uh, uh, chia seed, that's the two rich sources. And then you find a little bit in hemp, a little bit in soybean, a little bit in walnut, and a little bit in canola, along with omega-6s. Uh, but all, you know, those are, that's, that's only a few of the oils. But most oils don't contain omega-6 or, or contain omega-3s, maybe less than 1%. All the colorless, odorless, tasteless oils in transparent plastic bottles subject to damage by light, most of them are omega-6 only. Safflower, sunflower, grapeseed, corn, cottonseed, sesame, almond, and peanut. All just omega-6 oils. And then hemp, soybean, walnut, canola have omega-6 and omega-3. And then out of the omega-6, the body makes omega-6 derivatives. GLA, gamma-linolenic acid, then dihomo-gamma-linolenic acid, then arachidonic acid, and then docosapentaenoic acid, omega-6. Uh, and omega-6s are important in acute inflammation for healing. But if you get in chronic inflammation, that's due to the damage done to the omega-6s by the process, by the processing of industry, or the pesticides, or the plastic, or the damage you do by food preparation, or by other toxic molecules, or lack of omega-3s. Chronic inflammation is, it's not the omega-6s that are the cause of that, it's the damage done, or what's missing that causes that. It's really important to understand the difference between acute 
good inflammation for healing and chronic inflammation that is a sign that you need to change your oil. Uh, DGLA converted to series one eicosanoids. They are, uh, they're mostly anti-inflammatory hormone-like molecules that regulate cell function on a moment to moment basis. And arachidonic acid ARA turns into dozens of series two eicosanoids. And these do largely pro-inflammatory uh, activities for healing. And they will override the omega-3s when healing is necessary. And then over th omega-3s will override them when the healing is done. Again, really important that you, you have them both and you have them both optimized. And then DPA omega-6 is a powerful anti-inflammatory. Omega-6 damage done by industrial processing and food preparation can lead to chronic inflammation from damaged molecules. I already said that. Okay, and note that omega-6 conversion is not a problem, even though it uses the same enzymes as omega-3, because most people get enough omega-6 uh, omega in their food supply. And most people don't get enough omega-3 in the food supply. That's why conversion of omega-3 is a problem. Not because they can't convert, but because they're not getting the starting material. Next slide. Okay, so... Now we're talking about, okay, yeah, okay, non-essential fatty acids. They're not essential because they can be made in the body from sugar, starch, and protein. That's why they're not essential. Anything you can make out of, out of something else in your body is not essential. And that includes monounsaturated. They're mostly fuel and, and used in cell membrane structures. And olive oil and avocado are two well-known sources. Avocado oil, unfortunately, has no standards for production, which is also true for grape seed omega-6 oil. So I do not recommend either of those oils because they don't have standards. Extra virgin olive oil is not damaged by processing, but there's a lot of cheating going on because olive oil is being diluted with cheaper oils. And the reason is that olive trees grow really fast and the demand for extra virgin oil has grown very rapidly. I, sorry, olive oils grow really slow and extra virgin olive oil demand has grown really fast. And so what's a crooked merchant to do? You get the olive oil that you have and you dilute it and you, you make it something else. How do you know? The way I do it is I look in my fridge. If the olive oil in my fridge goes hard, it hasn't been adulterated. If it stays liquid, not so sure. If it doesn't, at least form some little crystals inside. They look like little snowflakes in the oil. If it doesn't, at least do that. I won't use the oil. That's the, that's a, you know, that may not be perfect. But if the olive oil goes completely solid, it's definitely 100% olive oil. Because the liquid oils they are adulterated with, they stay liquid in the fridge because they they're, have more omega-6s in them, and omega-6s stays liquid to a lower temperature. Okay, uh, so for health, no oil or fat, including olive oil, should ever be used for frying. You burn the food, you change molecules, you in, in, flee, increase inflammation and risk of cancer. And it doesn't matter whether you talk about proteins or carbs or fats and oils. When you overheat them, when you use them in the frying pan, you increase inflammation and risk of cancer for each one of them, independent of the others. Protein, carbs, fats and oils. What does that mean? Nothing you ever put in your mouth should first go through a frying pan. You know, I tell people to get their frying pan out. Everybody has one. You know, get it out, turn it upside down, hit yourself on the side of the head with it to associate it with pain. Throw that stupid thing out. Cook your foods in water. When I was a kid, cooking meant in water. Now, when we say cooking, we usually mean frying. We call that frying when I was a kid. Now we mean frying, we call it cooking. So the word has changed because everybody's using oil. It's a the most the stupidest thing we've done for health in the 2,000 to 100,000 years we've been here, however long we've been around, is to 
is is to invent frying pans for frying foods the worst thing for health we have ever invented my i don't have a frying pan anymore i i literally threw it in the garbage and now saturated fats they're also not essential because you can make them in the body they're they're fuel and cell membrane structure people like them because they're hard and they're stable so you don't have to bother with them and people like to be lazy and not do the work so a lot of people promote coconut and palm and uh, the people who are not plant-based uh, beef and beef tallow mutton tallow lard uh, saturated fats can make platelets more sticky so they'll head you towards cardiovascular disease they can also increase insulin resistance so that heads you towards diabetes but here's the kicker omega-3 protects you from saturated fats by making platelets less sticky and increasing insulin sensitivity. So the question you have to ask, given that omega-3s are essential nutrients and saturated fats are not, are we blaming saturated fats for what should be blamed on omega-3 deficiency? Because when you have enough omega-3s, then you can eat saturated fats without a problem so again but also again saturated fats should not be used for frying nothing should be used for frying except water and people ask you how what can i fry with water fry in water so you're basically cooking you never get over 100 degrees celsius 212 fahrenheit and you can't burn food if you don't heat it higher than that, unless it sticks to the bottom of the pan and then overheats through the heat. So that's why you have to stir and not keep it from burning. But water itself, anything that's 100 degrees will not burn. And of course, my view is eat foods raw as much as you can. Next slide, please. Okay, so this one is, you know, the question came up, and it's come up many times. Obviously, I've been at this for 40 years. I get the same questions over and over. Okay, should you get your essential fatty acids from foods only? And the idea was, well, you know, nature didn't make oils in bottles. That's true. And nature didn't process oils the way you do with health in mind. That's true. So the... Doesn't that mean that you shouldn't use oils and you should just eat seeds and nuts and wherever your oils are in, uh, vegetables, uh, everything has a little bit of fat in it, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables, maybe 0.1%, uh, whole grains, maybe 2 to 4%, beans, legumes, about 4%, soybeans, 18%, and then seeds and nuts anywhere from... 15% to 65% seeds, nuts, seeds and nuts. So there are lots of sources. Everything has some fat in it. And then the idea is, well, nature's mandate is makes whole foods. So that must be the best way to eat. So that asks the question, is nature's mandate optimum health? And that's a good question because I don't know the, I didn't know the answer. So I said, okay, I'll, I will try something. Because maybe, well, I'll, I'll tell you the story, and then I'll tell you the rest of that story. So I decided to put it to the test, just on myself. And so what I did is I, I took all my omega-3s and 6s in the 2 to 1 ratio that we have in the oil from seeds as much as I could eat. And I could eat 5 tablespoons of flax because flax absorbs water about six times its volume. So those five tablespoons turn to 30 tablespoons. That's a meal. And three tablespoons of sesame and sunflower seeds, all of it organic. Um, and, that was my, and that was my source, and I would get the two-to-one ratio from doing that. And ground them up, and that's all I could eat per day. And even in summer, when I only need two or three tablespoons rather than four in winter, in California, where I was living at the time, I could not keep my skin from gradually drying out 
on that amount, on the maximum amount of seeds and nuts that I could eat in the ratio we work with. And so I came to the conclusion that I can't do it on seeds and nuts and whole foods alone. Some people may be able to, I don't know that. And some people probably need even more oil than I do because some high metabolizers burn fats really rapidly. And they actually need more than the tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight that we, rec we recommend as, uh, as Optum, which is about 25% of calories. So I couldn't do it by the alone. And then I started to say, okay, well, maybe nature's mandate isn't optimum health. What is nature's mandate? Well, nature's mandate is to keep you healthy enough to grow up, keep you healthy enough to reproduce, keep you healthy enough to be around till your kids don't need you anymore. And when your kids don't need you anymore, nature doesn't need you anymore either. And then it's recycling time. Yeah, but that might happen by the time you're 45 or 50. What about the other 30 years that I've been alive, right? I just turned 81, right? What about that? Well, from nature's perspective, the best way to recycle your body when it doesn't need you anymore is to not have you be healthy. It is not, is to not have you be optimally healthy as you go as you go but to keep, just keep you healthy enough and then what happens is that as you get older and your cellular machinery slows down you will check out sooner if you're suboptimally healthy than you will if you're optimally healthy so my conclusion was it's not necessarily true that nature is about your optimum health or your maximum longe longevity you know because nature is a practical task giver right grow up have kids take care of the kids bye bye so uh and so anyway i couldn't do it so uh so i okay i just did all that okay even summer yeah Yes. So, so my conclusion to all that is eat, eat seeds and nuts, eat seeds and nuts, and you may need to also take oil to optimize your intake. Always mix the oil in foods. The essential fatty acids enhance flavors, improve absorption of oil-soluble nutrients present in food. And that's one of the reasons why we like oils and fats in foods, because they enhance flavors, but they're also good for health. Okay, thank you. Next, next slide. Okay, the production. So there are two ways. You know, the oil research never blames the damage done by processing on the negative effects that oils have on health. This is a key issue that needs airtime. And I don't know how it's gonna get airtime. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good at keeping that unknown. In fact, they've buried some of the, some of the journals that I used to read in the 80s. They're gone. And uh, some of the information was information that was uh, researched at that time. And uh, even the books that the oil chemists use, uh, there's a Bailey's uh, Oil and Fats Products is one of the books. They changed the books and wrote out some of the, uh, uh, some of the information that makes oils and oil production look bad. So here's how the goal of shelf life makes a mess. Start with organically grown seeds, so you got pesticides. Give it harsh chemical treatment to make colorless, odorless, tasteless oils. You do partial damage, they're called RBD oils, uh, refined, bleached, deodorized oils. And to make them, they're treated with sodium hydroxide, which is a very corrosive base. Phosphoric acid is a very corrosive acid. Bleach or bleaching clays, a turn oil rancid, and then to get rid of the rancidity that makes the oil smell bad, they distill wiped film evaporate or molecularly distill the oil. That means they boil the oil and you get partially damaged. There's the 0.5 to 1%. And you remove the protective antioxidant and anti-inflammatory molecules. So you lose your spark control molecules because they take them out of the oil. There's like white sugar, white flour, 
and I call these the colorless, odorless, tasteless oils, white oils, because you have the fuel, but you have all of the spark control has been removed. That's not what we do, but that's what the mainstream industry does. There's chemical residues left in the oil. And then I've, we've already talked about the damage done to the molecules, 60 quintillion, a six followed by 19 zeros. Uh, uh, if the oil is 1% damaged, that's what you get in one tablespoon. 10 different, more than 10 different kinds of dam mo damaged molecules. Uh, omega-3 molecules are five times more easily damaged. So you could expect that if the oil had a lot of omega-3s in it, you would get more than 1% damage. And nobody wants to work with the omega-3 oils for, for the reason of their sensitivity. And so then, <clears throat> so then you get all that and you, and you have all that uh, in a tablespoon, you multiply it by two to four, that's how many tablespoons a day you take. Then in, if you fry it, you got to multiply it by another three to six times. And then if you do that for 30 years, you multiply that by another 10,000 times. That's the number of damaged molecules that you get when you use those oils and use them that way. And then they didn't exist in nature, so life never made a breakdown process for them. They get the problems increase with time because we don't have a good way of getting rid of it. Mostly the shedding, shedding of the lining of the inside of the digestive tract and shedding skin is the way they're removed. Um, they're brought in faster than they're removed from the body and slowly they accumulate and eventually they interfere with normal, well, they interfere with normal natural interactions between molecules in the body, which is where all our physical problems come from. Interference, either blocking or sidetracking or derailing or interfering with normal natural interactions between normal natural molecules in the body. There's where disease begins. And then the containers, I've already talked about that. Light damages the oil in the clear transparent bottles and one photon will kick an electron out of orb orbit, create a free radical. That free radical then goes and steals another electron because they like to be in pairs. Um, you know, bachelor electrons, they like to be in place in, in pairs. So it steals it from another pair and then that one is a bachelor and then it steals it from another pair. And on average, a photon that creates a free radical would go through 30,000 free radical reaction before it settles down. So there's research on that. That's all been, uh, that's all been done. Okay, so we know about uh, the that and frying is the most damaging thing we've ever invented. And inflammation and cancer research studies ignore the damage done to health that results from the damage done to oils by processing. I have never seen that reported in a study on oils that talked about how oils affect physical health and disease conditions. I have never seen it pointed out in any article like that. I have read a hell of a lot of them, ever. But there was studies done on the damage done to oils. And that was in the old journals in the 80s. I think the journal was called Lipids at the time. And they laid all that out and they measured at least some of the damaged molecules. I don't think they knew all the different kinds of damaged molecules. But there was good information that said, yeah, half to 1% of the oil is damaged by the processing. So that's the numbers I'm using. Okay, next slide. Okay, and so the other way to do it is make oils with health in mind. So you got to start with organic seeds and nuts, no pesticides, very tight production system to press, filter, settle, fill, nitrogen flush. You got to protect, prevent contact with light, oxygen, heat, and that the system has to be super tight. So I had to develop that because it didn't exist. We had to create um, parts for the, for the presses and the, and the machines. That, that you can't buy off the shelf because the mainstream industry doesn't do that. And then the oil is unrefined, so it still has its flavor ingredients and its 
it's oil soluble protective anti-inflammatory ingredients they're still in there and it goes in dark glass bottles no plastic because plastic leaches and you want to cut out light so that's why the dark glass and then we put in a box to cut it out cut all, all light out and then it's refrigerated in the store in the factory actually in the store at home you refrigerate it if we ship it for longer than two weeks like if it goes to asia or north or or uh, uh, europe from north america then we actually ship it refrigerated now what's funny to me about it is you know we we ship ice cream around the world and steaks around the world and we freeze them so the refrigeration is available we just have never been smart enough to apply that system that we already have to the single most sensitive, most care requiring molecules in nutrition. Now, is it, that's stupid, no? <laughs> anyway, so, and then we add it to foods after they come off the heat source, but you can put it in hot soup and in steamed vegetables and in pasta sauce and uh, the different sauces. Uh, you know, and then you you add it after it comes off the heat source and as close to eating it as possible. Don't let don't let it sit around. You know, don't put the oil in and then let it, let it sit around for tomorrow or the next day or the next day. Add it and eat it, and then never use it for frying or other high heat applications. So that's what we do. Uh, you're probably familiar with the oil blend. It's called Udo's. Udo's Oil 369 blend, and that has nine ingredients, omega-3 and 6 in a 2 to 1 ratio. So, uh, so it's flax, sunflower, sesame, evening primrose, rice germ, oat germ, that's for the minor ingredients and the antioxidants, and uh, a tiny bit of uh, coconut for the flavor, and the anti has very good antioxidants in it. And then it's got lecithin, that's GMO lecithin that we have to bring in from Europe because we can't get it in North America. And uh, uh, mixed tocopherols for antioxidants. And a tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight. Don't use it off a spoon. You know, sometimes people get told to take it off a spoon. I never recommend that. If you take it off a spoon, sometimes people get in touch with me and they say, I don't like the taste of your oil. Oh, how, how, how did you take it? Well, I took it off a spoon. Oh, so when's the last time you took a cooking oil off a spoon? Oh, I never do that. Well, why are you doing that with mine? Oil has an oily taste. That's not going to change. Oil will never taste like ice cream. But if you mix it in food, it'll enhance flavors, and it'll actually make the foods have a nicer mouthfeel, and it will give you absorption of oil soluble nutrients, including many of the antioxidants and anti inflammatories that are in foods and spices. So that's my uh, that's my wrap here. Thank you, uh, john for moving the slides. And I think we have a little bit of time for questions, should you have any questions, comments or insults to throw my way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Udo, for that that very uh, informative presentation. There's definitely some new information um, that I'm going to have to digest, no pun intended. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, now we're going to open up to uh, to the audience, and and uh, we're going to start asking some questions. Um, before we do, I just want to go over um, how this works. So we do not take questions directly from the chat. We ask our audience to raise their hands. Yep. If they don't do that, what they need to do is... Uh, second from the bottom on the of the right on the Zoom window, you're going to click on the reactions button, and then you'll click on the raise your hand function. Uh, I, when I call on you, uh, I will unmute you, and then I will ask you to state where you're from and ask your question, and then we just ask that questions be uh, on topic and brief. So with that, um let, let me just ask you a uh, a quick question myself here um yep. so you, you talked about you know the oil that you make are there other oils on the market that that you think are acceptable to uh to consume that they meet that profile and haven't been destroyed okay we are the only oil and glass that's a big deal 
when okay. we started when we started in 1986 we put it in plastic because we could get pla black plastic bottles so that keep the light out completely but then i read in the Encyclo encyclopedia of plastics that oils if you put them in plastic they swell the plastic mm. and then the plastic leaches into the oil and i didn't know that and now there's research that says if you put a plastic film over the food the plastic will drift into the food in direct proportion to the amount of fat or oil in the food and when i found that out you know i'm i'm this i'm a i don't know if it's ocd or you know but i'm the kind of guy who says you know if i can do it better i want to do it better right perfection right mm -hmm. and sure. it's a uh, you know in some areas that's really important like if you're an accountant ocd is 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 a is a talent not a problem and if you want to make oils with health in mind ocd is a talent not a problem because you can be sloppy and you could do a lot of damage and that then does a lot of damage to people so we're the only ones so so when i read that i i told all the guys i worked with because they all learned it from me uh i said you know what we should go into into glass and none of them would do it except one and they didn't want to do it because plastic is cheaper and doesn't break and it's easier to work with and so we took the high road more effort on our part more care needs to be taken so we're the only ones who do it in glass and we're also the only ones who have the 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 blend there are a lot of people who sell flax oil in plastic bottles and where where would people find your uh your oil products uh well if they want to look at the information they can look at my website which is udoschoice.com or udoschoice.com or they can go to florahealth.com and find the oil there or they can call the company and their number is 1-800-446-2110 and if they don't want to do that they can go to the health food stores and they will find it in a brown glass bottle in a box in the fridge in the supplement section in the health food stores you can also buy it on amazon but amazon i'm not sure does does a good job refrigerating so i would recommend you go to the stores to get it or you get it shipped directly from the company and um and you, you did touch on this on your presentation but can you just go over again how much do you recommend each day uh ballpark 25 percent of calories which is about a tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight per day mixed in foods, intake spread out over the course of the day. Reason you want to spread it out is if people's liver is weak, then they oil, if they take too much oil at any one time, then the liver is going to say, don't give me so much. And it does that by making them feel heavy, tired, or nauseous. So sometimes when people start, they, they take too much or they take it off a spoon and they say, ah, you know, I didn't feel good. Yeah, how did you take it? Well, you know, no, 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 no. Start small, work up, always mix it in food. And then you slow down it, the liver's job of processing it. And I have taken 17 tablespoons one time on an empty stomach because I, wa I wanted to see what would happen. That's a lot. That's like eight, eight and a half ounces, right? Yeah, and what happened? What happened? I was completely not hungry the entire day. I did it at 8 in the morning, 8.30 in the morning. I worked all day. I was not tired all day. And for probably half of that time, I was like floating on the edge of nausea. <laughs> like I wasn't, I wasn't super nauseous, but so I hit my limit at 17 tablespoons, but I've been using oil. You know, when you use oils, your liver capacity increases, but some people, if they've been on a low fat diet, like a lot of people, I think maybe listening to this, they may be on pretty much low fat diets. And their liver then capacity goes down. So start small. And I would say, look, take a tablespoon per 50. If you can't do that, take a tablespoon. If you can't do that, take a teaspoon. If you can't do that, take a few drops. If you can't do that, take a drop. If you can't do that, take a lick. And if you can't do that, take a whiff. But start wherever you need to start. And then gradually, as your capacity for processing oils increases, increase it to the tablespoon per 50. And then after a while, your skin will tell you, you know, you might need a little more than that. You might need a little less than that. If your skin is dry, you need more oil, right? And then in summer, you'll need less than in winter. 
And in, in dry climates, you'll notice it more than in humid climates. But ballpark tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight per day. So, so following up on that, with regard to skin, you know, I kind of the uh, the state of your skin, whether or not it's dry, uh, being the the benchmark on, on yeah. whether or not you're getting enough fatty acids, essentially. Yeah. Um, if you're eating a whole food plant based diet and your skin isn't dry, do you need to supplement with oil? Uh, if that was my case, I would experiment with it and see if I get more energy. Mm -hmm. or even better skin because I don't know the answer because people are different. I know for me, I couldn't do it just with whole foods. If you can just do it with whole foods, I don't have a problem with that. You know, I'm not here to pitch you on you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, right? I'm, yeah. I'm interested in your health and, and you have to pay attention to what your body tells you because I can't pay attention for you because I don't live inside of you, right? So if you can do it without oil, yeah, play with it. But the thing is, the thing is, what I've provided is getting oils undamaged and, and non-toxic, made with care. And then you use them with care. And then they, if they don't help you, don't use them. If they help you, use them. And, and besides your, your oil product and Anderson, all the benefits of how you've made it, you know, you've kind of like looked at what was being done and then you've kind of engineered it to, to make yeah. sure that you're doing the same kind of damage. Yeah. Are there, are there any other oils that you would recommend like oil types that tend to be healthy for people or they all suffer from this process damage? Uh, no, they don't all suffer from processing damaged extra virgin olive oil. It, if it hasn't been, uh, if they hasn't been adulterated has not been damaged because it's made by a different process. It's floated off on water. And they don't put extra virgin olive oil through Drano window washing acid bleaching it, bleach it and fry it before it goes in the bottle. But extra virgin olive oil has no omega threes, like this is less than one percent, and only ten percent omega six, eighty percent omega nine, which is monounsaturated, and then the rest ten percent saturated. And here's the thing what, that's really important to understand: when it comes to the entire universe of fats and oils. Only omega-3 and omega-6 are required for life and for health. And they need to be in the right ratio, right? Mm -hmm. And after that, you don't have to eat any saturated fats. Your body can make them out of sugar and starch. You don't have to make any mono, you don't have to eat any monounsaturates because your body makes them out of sugar and starch. And there's a lot of things that people say about how wonderful olive oil is from the perspective of the only thing that's essential from fats and oils, it's actually very mediocre. But the good part of it is it's not damaged. But if you then use it for frying, because it's such a good oil, then you're doing the same stupid thing that people are doing when they fry other oils. You do damage to the oil and then the oil will damage you. You know, I, I say to people, fried oils fry health, fried foods fry health, Right. Repeat after me. Fried oils, fry health, fried oils, fry health. And while you do that, in between doing that, hit yourself on the head with the frying pan. Fried yeah. oils, fry <laughs> head, doink, fried egg, doink, right? Only omega-3 and omega-6 are essential. People avoid them because of how difficult they are to work with. And okay. then they gotta then they gotta get into something else. But from a perspective of benefits to health. If the oils are made right and balanced right, more health benefits than any other change you make in nutrition. It's that clear. And I should say to you, is that clear? That, that is clear. <laughs> is that clear? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that sounds like a school in school, right? No, it's but it's but it is like that, right? So so you know, we have a lot of speakers, you know, in the hope in the um whole food plant-based world. And you've kind of spoken to this, uh, you know, right. a little bit about how there is this idea of, of no oil, you know, oil should be a bad, you know, avoided. It's bad for your health. Yeah. Why is that? Like, has any of them actually like looked at your oil 
to kind of evaluate it to see if if um, that would make sense. And 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 the research that's been done has research been done specifically on your oil that's in any sort of peer reviewed journal that they would look at. That uh, they could- to, no, okay. no, we have done research on it with athletes. Uh, both strength and endurance athletes, but we're not affiliated with the university. And they wanted us, to, they wanted, we had to be affiliated with the universe and, and uh, we would have had to bring a professor in, but the professors have agen- also have agendas. Mm-hmm. They're working in the oil industry, somebody's paying them, right? So we haven't done the, the, the review studies. I don't know if the no fat, the no oil people have evaluated the oil in their practice? I don't know the answer, but I'll tell you why they have been misled. Because they, you know, they're doctors and researchers and like they do the work and, you know, they're pretty smart. Sometimes they're a little too cocky, but that's just my opinion. But so what they do is they go into the literature and they read the research done on oils. Mm -hmm. And there's like, I don't know how many, there's like 300, I think there's 300,000 studies, probably more, probably 600,000 studies done on oil and health or oil and disease. Ballpark, thousands of studies. They read the study and so they they say, here's what we tried to find out. Sorry, here's what we tried to find out. Here's how we set it up. Here's the method we used. Here's the results we got. And here's what we think it means. And these are our conclusions. That's kind of like how they do the scientific studies. Almost all of those studies were done with the damaged oils. And nobody talks about whether whether the results come from the oil. They come from the oil. But they don't tell you, does that come from the omega-6s in the oil? Does it come from the omega-3s in the oil? Does that come from the pesticides? Does that come from the plastic? Does that come from the 1% 60 quintillion damaged oil molecules from the processing? Nobody talks about the processing. I had a woman who was a TV anchor in New York. And when I told her the story, when she, she got found out, she, when I met her and we talked about oils and she was cooking, she changed <clears throat> all her recipes because she took the salad oils out of her recipes, right? Salad cooking oils. She said to me, you know, he said, the most important newsworthy thing that you're talking about that should be going to the anchor person on the news is the damage done to oils by processing because of how sensitive they are. That is the most newsworthy thing, and it has never made the mainstream news. And I, I told you part of that story. They, you know, <clears throat> they didn't, they didn't play, they, they, they got, took the interview, and they said they were going to do it, and then they didn't do it, but instead they ran an ad for damaged oil because they're making oil from it. So how do you get on mainstream media if it's supported <laughs> by the thing that you're saying we shouldn't be doing, right? And yeah. so it's a, it, it's interesting. But and the way that that we've grown, and we're not that big, but the way that we've grown is simply from person to person, and uh, people so consistently see benefits in their health that a lot of our our advertising has been done by people to their friends. So, and we have a long list of things, things that people have said about how, how the oil helped them. And we didn't know. I, I mean, when I made the oil, I knew it would do some good because you make it without health in mind. You make it with health in mind. Or probably if it's made with health in mind and you do it right, probably it'll get better results than if it's not made with health in mind. But I didn't know that it would be that widespread. widespread. It's really, it's really, it's so... And I, I, I'm still excited about it. You know, this is like 86, this first oil. 1980, I started working with oils. I'm still excited about it because it's so good, because it works, right? And of course, I'm trying to talk to lots of people who don't like oils. I, I know that many, many of the speakers are those people. I, I know them by name. Uh, not, I don't know them all, but I know them by name. I know I've had a conversation with one of them. He hasn't changed his mind. And uh, I, I'm not here to change their mind. I'm just here to tell the story. If it helps somebody, if it helps a few people, 
That's good. Yeah, feels yeah. good. Feels good right here when when what I when so, something you do actually helps people. Your, your passion definitely shows through. So I'm going to take a question from uh, one of yeah. our audience members. Okay. Uh, Jay, can you state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, I'm Jay from um, the UK. I was reading about black seed oils and the benefits of uh, all the polyphenols and everything. Uh, what is your view on this? Uh, I use flax. Uh, I'm sorry, black seed. Black seed comes from the from the Middle East. Uh, the, the saying about it was that Muhammad is said to have said, "Black seed cures every ailment, every human ailment except death." So I use black seed. I do not use the oil. The oil has no omega-3s. It's about 40% omega-6. When people make the oil, I don't know how they make it. It's usually in plastic bottles. So I just get the seed and I chew them up and grind them up and I use them in, in my uh, organic tahini. Where I take organic tahini, I dump the tahini oil because it's 45% omega-6, no omega-3. Put my oil in because it's a better oil. Mix it up, put put herbs and spices in, and then I dip my vegetables in it when I eat my raw vegetables, broccoli and stuff. I don't know. I hope that helps. Uh, I'm I would I, I I give more marks to the seed than the oil. So just to, just so I can understand what you just said. So when the tahini, when you get tahini and the oil has separated out of the tahini, you dump that oil and then you add your oil back in place. Yeah, because I'm exchanging an omega six oil. Mm -hmm. We get enough of that with an oil that en enriches you in omega-3 and has, you know, the tahini oil is not damaged because all they do is grind it up, put it in a, you know, it's unrefined, but it's an omega-6 oil. And uh, the omega-3 has made a huge difference to me. I used to be very cold sensitive. I'm not cold sensitive anymore. Omega-3s warm you. They give you thermogenesis, right? They, so that's why they're so good in winter. And that's also why you find omega-3s in North Country, like near the poles. The further north you go, the more omega-3s are in the food supply. You know, a fish swimming in cold water needs to be able to swim fast, even though it's cold and they're cold-blooded, right? And the omega-3s give them that energy. In the tropics, you don't need that. So in the tropics, it's more saturated, it goes more saturated, then more monosaturated, then more omega-6, then more omega-3, if you go from the pole, from the from the tropics to the poles. You're saying the fish have, are more, like that, have that oil, or that, that oil content in them? Is that what you're saying? Well, the northern fish, yeah. The cold water fish, but the tropical fish, no, not so much. Right. Thank you. So, yeah. all right, next question is coming from, uh, from Steve. Steve, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, Steve from New York. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, you aware of the T.J. Robinson Fresh Press Olive Oil Club? No, no, I'm not. Okay. Don't expect you to be aware of everything in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know the way I the way I measure olive oil because it can be adulterated. You, when olive oil is adulterated with cheaper oils. And it's because the olives grow, olive trees grow slowly. The demand uh, exponentially grew exponentially over the past twenty years. So they use cheaper oils, and those oils are either soybean or canola, and those have a lot of omega six and omega three in them. And if you mix those with olive oil, depending on how much you use that makes the oil more liquid and it won't crystallize in the fridge if you have a really good olive oil and you put it in the fridge it actually goes solid and if you don't at least get some some crystals floating in the olive oil then my view is that the oil has been doctored that's the best i can do for a way to measure whether the olive oil I have is actually olive oil or is something, something that's been doctored. Great, and um, we got another uh, audience member question, and we have about three minutes left. So, uh, okay. so please uh, stay where you're from and ask your question. Priscilla, 
Oh, um, hello. Hi. I want um so would you suggest that if we get extra virgin olive oil um that we poured into a glass container? Question number one and number two, can we put your oil on our skin? Thank you. Oh yeah. Okay, they uh so is the oil that you're talking about in plastic? Yes, it can we I, pour it I, I would into not a buy, glass. I would not buy oil in plastic. Okay. Just because just because the, the plastic swells and plastic goes in the oil, then you put it in a glass bottle, you still got plastic in your oil. It's already in okay. there. So I wouldn't do that. In terms of putting it on your skin, you can do that, but here's the problem. If you put the oil in your skin, and there are people in Europe who do that, mostly women, they do their calisthenics naked, you know, they exercise in the morning naked, they put oil on their skin before they do their, their movement, and they do it for 20 to 30 minutes, let the oil get absorbed. Then they take a warm shower without soap just to wash off the excess oil. And their skin okay. is amazing. But yeah, if you do that, uh -huh. let me finish. But if you do that, you have to be careful because if there's oil on your skin and you put on your clothes, the oil will rub off in, your, in the seams on your clothes and it will harden into paint and you can't get it out once that's done. Okay, so, can we put it on our face? Your your oil, the one that you are selling. You on yeah, our face. You, yeah, you could you could put it on your face, but with that, but why not oil your skin from within? Yeah. Because if you put it on the outside, then you don't know what your optimum is because you're messing up the measuring system. So you want to take it inside, oil your skin from within when your skin is soft and velvet and you don't need other gunk on your skin. That's a good sign that you've optimized your intake. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And we have about one minute left. Um, and um, I, I, is there anything? I mean, basically, we got one minute, so I don't know if we can answer a question, but is there anything you want to leave the audience with in that last minute? No, I just hope you have a, I, I just hope you, uh, you uh, make the most of this gift of life you have and you enjoy it to the utmost and you're fully present in it because it's a gift that is personal and nobody else can enjoy it for you. So if you don't enjoy this gift that you have of being alive, then it's a wasted gift. So don't waste the gift. Great, thank you. Be and fully present in it, have, the, have a great life. Great, thank you. And awesome. again, your, your energy is, uh, is, is infectious. So I, I wanna thank you for that very, that very informative presentation. As I said, if we can unmute the audience, please. Gonna put them upstairs. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.